Welcome to today's webinar, Enforcing Your Trademark and Design Rights in Europe. Thank you all for joining us today for this event. Um, my name is Dirk Wiedeken. I am a partner at Taylor Westing's Hamburg office in Germany. I'm joined for this presentation by my London partner, Mark Owen, Martin Prohaska from our Vienna office in Austria, Deep Gavas, a fellow partner at the Hamburg office, and Jeremy Kahena, a senior associate from our Paris office. This webinar is the second event in a series that Taylor Westing is offering as a follow-up to our publication of the On Your Marks, Get Set Europe Guide to Brand Protection in Europe, which is available on our website. We will be spending a little over 45 minutes talking about the legal framework for enforcing trademark rights in Europe. I will begin with a few facts and figures about trademarks in Europe and provide a quick overview of the legal framework for enforcement before addressing how to establish jurisdiction for bringing trademark infringement claims and the big applicable law for such actions. My colleagues from other Taylor Westing offices will then take over and provide an overview of available remedies, both under the European framework and the national law of the different member states. Um, we encourage you to uh, post questions if you have any uh, about the content uh, of uh, what we say here. There is a, a tool on the interface you see in front of you on the bottom right corner. You can submit the questions and uh, if we have the time, we will be happy to address them at the end of the presentation. If we don't have the time, we will be happy to get back to you individually. So let's get started and kick off with a few figures on trademark rights in Europe. First, an overview of the total number of trademarks in force in select countries and territories. As you can see, China tops the list with over 10 million trademarks, but of course this figure is skewed compared to other jurisdictions because China only allows single class trademark applications. A more interesting figure to compare here is the figure for the US with about 2 million life marks compared with about half the amount, 1 million, registered with the European Union Intellectual Property Office. The table also contains some figures for national jurisdictions. About a million national trademarks are registered in Germany and almost 600,000 in the United Kingdom. If you add the national trademarks to the EU marks registered with the EU IPO, you come to a very considerable amount of trademark rights that can potentially be enforced in the EU. Current filing activity by trademark application class counts shows that about a third of current filing activity goes to China and 6 and 4 percent respectively to the United States Trademark Office and the European Union Intellectual Property Office. New filings with the EU IPO have steadily increased over the years and currently number about 140,000 per year. Now it's very difficult to obtain reliable information on the number of infringement proceedings. What you can see here is the number of cases that have been brought in the context of customs proceedings. Again, what we see over the years is a steadily increasing figure of cases approaching 100,000 per year currently within the EU. If we look at the local distribution amongst the member states, the United Kingdom, Germany and Belgium stand out. The reason for Belgium being so prominent here is probably because uh, of the Antwerp harbour that is one of the largest ports of entry for goods including counterfeit goods into Europe. The community trademark, now the EU trademark, is by far the most extensively enforced intellectual property rights amongst the most custom cases. Local trademarks play a more limited role and other IP rights um, are all even uh, less commonly asserted. Now Taylor Wesley has done its own research into how effective the trademark regimes in different countries are perceived to be. Last year, we published the fifth edition of our Global Intellectual Property Index, which provides a comprehensive assessment of how the intellectual property regimes of 43 important jurisdictions, including the European Union, compare with each other. The rankings are based on an extensive international survey. You can see that the European Union and many of its core jurisdictions are ranked very highly. The European Union's enforcement regime and those of the major jurisdictions are mostly praised for the com competence of their judges, relatively fast outcomes, and their cost effectiveness. Indeed, one of the factors that prevented the United States from achieving an even better rank was an often cited concern about the cost of both litigation and opposition proceedings. The Global Intellectual Property Index does contain a wealth of further information and the full report is available on our website, 
So if you are interested and can find the time, I recommend that you have a look at it. With this, I turn to an overview of the legal framework for enforcing trademark rights in Europe. As you will all be aware, trademark protection in the EU comes in two flavors. Trademark owners can choose to apply for national trademarks under the local laws of the member states, or they can obtain trademark protection through an EU trademark registered with the European Intellectual Property Office, uh, formerly the Harmonization Office, in Alicante, Spain. European Union trademarks are governed by a regulation that directly applies in all member states. National trademarks are subject to the different national trademark acts, but these in turn have been harmonized to a very significant degree through the European Trademark Directives, which you find listed on this slide, and the case law of the European Court of Justice. So what are the core issues to consider when looking at enforcement in Europe? First, the enforcement regime will differ significantly depending on whether a EU trademark or a national trademark is enforced. Second, when assessing the available jurisdictions for enforcing a trademark, right owners can in principle choose between the place of residence of the infringer and the place where the infringing act has taken place. This choice has important consequences for the scope of the jurisdiction of the respective court. I will discuss this in more detail shortly. Third, while the enforcement of national trademarks will be governed by local laws, fairly complex legal issues surrounding the applicable law can arise when enforcing a EU trademark. Fourth, the available remedies can differ very significantly between the individual jurisdictions, despite ongoing attempts by the European Union to harmonize the enforcement regime to a certain degree. So where can a trademark owner enforce its trademark? This question is obviously fairly easy to answer if a national trademark is infringed in the country where it is registered by a resident of that country. In multi-state scenarios, the answer becomes a little bit more complex. The main legal basis for establishing jurisdiction is Article 7.2 of the Brussels 1A regulation. This provision establishes jurisdiction for tort and delict claims in the courts for the place where the harmful event occurred, and it also applies to trademark infringement. Now let me give you an example from the case law of the ECJ to illustrate what this is. In the Wintersteiger case, a German company had bought a Google AdWord with the German Google subsidiary for the Google DE website in Germany. The plaintiff, an Austrian corporation, alleged an infringement of its trademark registered in Austria. The ECJ held that first, the plaintiff could sue in Austria because that was where the harmful event, namely the infringement of the trademark itself, took place. But it didn't stop there. It also held that the German courts had jurisdictions as well, because Article 7.2 also established jurisdiction in the place where the event giving rise to the damage occurred. This was Germany, where the entity booking the advert had its place of business. Consequently, the plaintiff could effectively choose where to assert its claim for trademark infringement. It could go either to the place where the infringed trademark was registered, or it could go to the place, if different, where the act that eventually led to that infringement, in this case, the registration of the AdWord, took place. In the case of European Union trademarks, registered with the EU IPO, the trademark regulation does have its own dedicated provisions addressing jurisdiction. Again, the plaintiff can primarily rely on the domicile of the infringer. The defendant is not domiciled within the EU, an establishment of the defendant, for example, a representative office of a company that has its, uh, its seat outside of the Union, can be sufficient to establish jurisdiction in the place where that establishment exists. If no such establishment exists, the plaintiff can actually sue in the place where itself is domiciled or it has an establishment. If none of these conditions apply, because both defendant and plaintiff do not have any presence within the EU, the courts at the place of the European Union Intellectual Property Office in Alicante, Spain, are responsible. Now, in practice, this means that a company within the EU can sue a foreign company that does not have an establishment in the Union before its home courts, which can, of course, be very convenient. Now, let me give you an example of a case that we handled recently where a U.S. company operated a website with a trademark um, that was attacked by a German company which deemed that trademark to be infringing its own rights in Europe. 
It was not very difficult to establish that the trademark was being used in Europe because contact details for Germany were given and the website operated from the US very obviously also to a certain extent addressed the German market and that was sufficient to establish a use of the trademark in Germany. Now because the US company did not have any presence in Germany or elsewhere in the EU, uh, the German company could actually sue with its home court and that home court um, granted an EU-wide uh, injunction, which I will address in a minute in more detail, preventing um, the US company from using its trademark throughout all of the EU. And compliance with that kind of order is very difficult as long as you have a website that addresses the European market and does not employ uh, technology, technologies like geo-blocking to prevent users from uh, the EU from accessing it. So effectively, that injunction required the US company to change um, its trademark on its home website that was primarily addressed at the US market. Now, alternatively, lawsuits can also be brought in the place where the infringing act is taking place. There are, however, important differences between the scope of the jurisdiction in both cases. If the jurisdiction is based on the place of domicile, the court will have EU-wide jurisdiction. In practice, this means, as in the example I just uh, described, that a court can issue an EU-wide injunction against the trademark infringement. So a German court can potentially prohibit the defendant from using the mark in the UK, at least uh, as long as Brexit has not been executed, and because at that point um, this will very likely no longer be the case. So if the jurisdiction is uh, based on the place of infringement, no EU-wide injunction is available, but the court's authority will be limited to the local member state. So in the example provided above, an injunction could only be rendered against the use of the trademark in Germany itself. One point to note is that the jurisdiction based on the place of the infringing act is not available for negative declaratory actions. And this excludes so-called torpedo claims in trademark matters. Now, torpedo claims concern a situation where a defendant expects that a plaintiff will bring an infringement suit and then preemptively introduces a negative declaratory action for non-infringement in the courts of a member state that is notorious for its slow-moving procedure. Under ordinary procedural rules, this would prevent the plaintiff from bringing the infringement suit in another jurisdiction before the first court has declared itself not to have jurisdiction over the matter. And this is not uncommon, for example, in patent matters. An exemption in Article 97.5 of the EU trademark regulation does not make this possible for trademark claims. Once the international jurisdiction in a member state has been established, the local jurisdiction for claims based on EU trademarks follows national rules. However, the EU trademark regulation requires that the member states designate certain courts as EU trademark courts. The language of the regulation says that this should be as limited a number as possible. And in some jurisdictions, like France, Austria, and Finland, this was actually taken seriously, and these jurisdictions only designated a single EU trademark court. Other jurisdictions, such as Germany and the UK, designated quite a significant number of individual courts as their EU trademark courts. The law applicable to an infringement action will again depend on whether a national trademark or an EU trademark is asserted. In the case of national trademarks, the territoriality principle applies and the law of the place where the mark has been infringed is applicable. This sounds obvious, but it can lead to the requirement that certain national courts have to apply the trademark law of another member state. You will recall the Wittersteiger example I cited above, where a German court would have jurisdiction over infringement claims brought by an Austrian entity based on the registration of that word in Germany. Because this concerns the infringement of an Austrian mark, the German court would have to apply Austrian law to the case. In the case of European Union trademarks, the EU trademark regulation is of course applicable. The regulation concerns an autonomous claim for injunctive relief as remedy that is applicable directly in all member states. And this obviously makes it much easier to assert EU-wide injunctions. For all other remedies and all legal issues not addressed by the EU trademark regulation, the national law remains applicable. Again, the national law of the place where the infringement takes place is decisive. While a single court in a member state can still have EU-wide jurisdiction as discussed earlier, 
it would need to assess the damage claim under all applicable national laws. That is one reason why, in practice, the EU-wide jurisdiction is mostly only used to assert injunctive relief. Given the practical problems the court faces when applying foreign law, it is more common to assert damage claims and other remedies for each country in the respective country's own courts. Given these challenges, the European Union has attempted to harmonize the enforcement regime somewhat. But this issue leads directly to the question of the available remedies, for which I will hand over to my London partner, Mark Owen. Thanks very much, Dirk, and hello, everybody. Uh, as Dirk said, the, uh, there are, there's a framework of rules within the trademark rules, but then there's a separate framework to do with the remedies which apply to any intellectual property claim under the IP Enforcement Directive, which was introduced by the EU in 2004. The Enforcement Directive is a harmonizing measure to some extent. It creates a minimum standard for countries to follow in terms of the available, available remedies, the range of available remedies it, it says should be there for rights owners, but it doesn't go so far as to say that these are the only remedies. So it is possible for member states to have additional remedies and to implement the enforcement directive remedies in slightly different ways, which creates some scope for some degree of forum shopping if you have the right kind of case. Um, the, I suppose the, the most important principle which comes out of the enforcement directive is the idea that remedies should be effective and proportionate to what is going on. When the enforcement directive first came in, I think there were a number of member states which felt, well, we're fine, we've got good IP remedies, we know what we're doing, this doesn't really affect us. And it's gradually dawned on um, them, and, I, and I'm thinking here particularly of some of the English court judges who for a long time thought the enforcement directive did nothing. It's dawned on them that actually there are different ways of looking at remedies, particularly if you apply this effective and proportionate remedies language. And so, for example, where it used to be almost automatic that a particular type of injunction would be granted or damages would naturally be awarded in a particular way. Increasingly now, arguments are being made that that remedy isn't really the right remedy for this particular case, that the court should consider the harm, what's the best way of, of avoiding the harm continuing, but not necessarily crucifying the uh, defendant. And as a result, you're seeing, I think, much more nuanced decisions starting to come out of many of the courts. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the specific uh, areas uh, of the enforcement directives to do with financial compensation and damages, and then hand over to my colleagues. Before um, doing so, I should just flag that the enforcement directive is constantly being reviewed. Although it hasn't changed markedly since it was first introduced, there is pressure to change it. And one of the things that's coming up very soon which may change it is the EU's digital single market strategy which is aiming to reduce barriers to trade uh, in respect to digital goods and services in the way that uh, the barriers have been reduced to physical goods and services already. And as part of that, uh, it, it covers all sorts of things which are not necessarily to do with IP, but as part of that, it has various provisions to do with IP, and it is aiming to change some of the way IP enforcement is done, so to make it easier for rights owners to deal with commercial scale digital infringement, to make evidence um, or the obtaining of evidence easier, again, working out who it is who's involved in the, in the infringement, uh, strengthening the right for information that way, and also making it clearer what the liability and responsibilities are of platforms in between who may be in some way helping or facilitating the infringement or may have information as to who's behind it. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, although that is still being discussed and won't be finalised, I think, until later this year in terms of what it's going to be, and then won't actually take effect probably for another year or so after that. So just in terms of what we're going to cover in terms of the enforcement directive, I'm going to talk about damages and financial remedies. Then Martin Prohaska from Vienna is going to talk about the evidence and information type remedies. Wiebke in Hamburg will deal with injunctions. And then finally, Jeremy in Paris will look at both legal costs uh, and the publicity order type of remedy, which uh, is, was a new one to at least some jurisdictions such as the UK, but has, but has been an interesting kind of remedy. So, damages. 
Damages is, is, is one of those topics that people, I think, thought they were fairly familiar with, but the Enforcement Directive has added some, some interesting new angles to that. So normally, it's about compensating the rights holder, to put the rights holder back in the position it would have been had the infringement not taken place. And as a result, the, the focus of the Enforcement Directive is not on punishing the defendant. Um, there's nothing in there saying that you can get uh, double, triple, whatever, punitive type damages against infringers. But that doesn't mean to say that you may not be able to do so under the law of some countries, and I'll come back to that, because as I say, the Enforcement Directive creates a minimum standard, not a fully harmonized set of procedures. Uh, there are different ways of, of approaching damages, and I'll come on to those in the next slide, but the, the main area that the court is looking at is the negative economic consequences for the rights holder, including lost profits, and then after that, possibly unfair profits made by the infringer. An interesting uh, new dimension in some cases has been this idea that non-economic elements may also come into play here. Uh, and the, the language used in the directive is around moral prejudice caused the rights holder. That's one of those phrases that um, gives rise to a lot of uh, legal arguments and fun for lawyers as to what exactly moral prejudice means, particularly in an IP context. And you probably won't be surprised to know that in the UK courts, at least most of the cases involving moral prejudice so far have been around copyright as a, as a kind of extension of moral rights about the way content has been used. But it's the sort of thing that can be included in arguments about uh, trademark infringement as well. Looking at the specifics of how damages are calculated, there are really three approaches, I think. And the way that most rights holders will approach damages, if they can, is on the basis of actual damages. And the reason I think they'll approach it on that basis if they can is because that is likely to get them more, in most cases, than the other two. Actual damages will be loss of profits, revenue, what happens in terms of price reduction, lost sales, um, all those sorts of factors. And if, you can, if you've got good evidence, then that, I think, can, can, in many cases, get you more in the way of damages than some of the other approaches. The next one down is looking at the infringer's profits. Um, the, and that sounds great, but it isn't always the, the best option. As a result, those cases are actually fairly rare and few and far between because the, the claimant is often not sure of what the defendant's financial situation is. The defendant may not have made much of a profit. The defendant may have deliberately flooded the market with relatively cheap goods in order to create market share, and so there isn't much profit to gain. So the, the, the last approach is actually perhaps the most common, at least in, in the course of many member states, which is it's quite difficult to calculate the actual damages, it's quite difficult to calculate the infringer's profits, so let's look at a notional or fictitious license fee. Let's imagine that this claimant and this defendant entered into a negotiation about a license for what's going on. What deal would they have agreed on, acting reasonably? And as, as I'm sure many people on the call have experienced, that can be quite an expensive process. You get, it, you get economic and accountancy experts involved. You argue as to different comparators from different kinds of cases, uh, and the court then comes up with some kind of royalty. But in many cases, it's difficult to do, but it's, it's really the only way. Damages tend not to arise in any interim proceedings. Um, I say that tend not to because it, they can, in the UK, for example, come up after uh, summary judgment applications, which, which I suppose some people may regard as a shortened, if not an interim proceeding. Uh, but usually you will have an urgent injunction and then you'll have the case carrying on and there may be damages at the end of it. Uh, and usually the onus of proof is on the, on the claimant to present evidence of all the facts that lead to the infringement and show how the damage has been won. But in these cases about notional license fees, both parties will normally have expert evidence from accountants about how that would have been calculated. That's the system as it is, and that system I think is quite familiar not only to member states of the EU already, but also to, to many other countries around the world, because those are the, the best ways people have come up with dealing with it. However, that doesn't mean to say that parties involved in these sorts of claims are 
satisfied that that's the best way. And as a result, there is a lot of pressure at the moment to reform the enforcement directive. Rights holders are saying there's too little money being awarded and the procedures for getting there are too cumbersome and so it's all a disincentive to them to go for damages at all. Now, I know in some countries there are lists of or, or statutory amounts of damages which can be awarded in smaller cases without there being much in the way of legal argument. And as I say, approaches like that are possible in some member states, um, but not everywhere. In some countries, for example, England, you have to have a separate damages hearing after the trial, and that can be almost as expensive as, as having a trial in the first place. And so can, is often something that's not worth doing, and most cases settle on some kind of damages calculation between the parties. You also get the idea that in some infringers deliberately infringe, know they'll have to pay something, but assume that when they come to it, they'll just have to pay the license fee they would have had to pay if they'd done the negotiation in the first place. And so there's no real risk for them, and they might get away with it or not be asked. Um, and rights holders are keen for the EU to put in place some disincentives for that sort of application. There is language already in the enforcement directive which probably allows it, um, but in practice many member states have not introduced anything to address this. And the final point of the, of the difficulty at the, at the moment, uh, as Dirk mentioned in his opening, is Although you can get pan-EU injunctions, it's very difficult. There's no real process for getting pan-EU damages. You have to go country by country. And dealing with that in some way is, is high up the list of things that the Commission's being asked to deal with. Just to mention one final point, is, which is about punitive damages, which I flagged earlier on. As I say, the directive does not introduced really in any clear way anyway, the idea of there being punitive damages. So it says there can be set amounts by member states for certain types of things. Does it mean though that punitive damages are banned? Uh, this has come to the court recently, the European Court recently, in a case called OTK out of Poland, in a case which allowed for double damages in certain IP cases. Was that permitted? The CJEU said that there was nothing in the enforcement directive that prevented it, and so as a result, uh, that's gone back to the local court, but it, it looks like it'll be upheld. And that is perhaps a neat link into my colleague, Martin Prohaska, who's going to talk about the next stage, because as I understand it, Austria is one of those countries, like Poland, that allows double damages. Martin. Thanks, Mark. Good evening from Vienna. Yes, actually in Austria we have some punitive damages, however not in the true concept like in the OTK case, because we still have to prove the causal relationship. However, there is no need to prove loss. Uh, I will now briefly talk on information orders in the EU and particularly in CEE. So we do not have a US style discovery in Anton Pillar fashion. Those orders are limited to criminal investigations. However, the enforcement directive has been implemented in all CEE countries. And thus there is a law on in the such orders, which is however, rarely issued in practice. Uh, also, the law provides for provisional measures to preserve evidence and uh, for claims on the, um, let's say, information on, uh, for example, IP addresses with timestamps. Yeah, so we have this implemented. What is important to know is that the claim for information overrides data privacy. In the Corti case, which was a case from Germany, it was decided by the ECG that a bank may not refuse to communicate opponent's bank account details if that account was used for transactions in relations with pirated products. Thus, in practice, it means that the right of data privacy must be balanced against claimant's right for information. 
Um, a brief note on um, the requirement of written evidence. This is mandatory in CEE, I would say, and it has to be submitted at the time of application, of course. And there is a limitation on further evidence in appeal proceedings in most Eastern countries, such in Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. Moving on, on witnesses, uh, usually uh, you don't see oral examination of witnesses. There are affidavits, unsworn statements. Uh, however, in practice, the judges allow and witnesses for examination, though usually without lawyers being allowed to ask questions. Therefore, we use this uh, term camera obscura. Moving on to um, search orders, we have talked on them already in the beginning of my part. I'm now already at the bank guarantees in information order cases. Um, uh, bank guarantees are allowed only in some countries. Yeah, in Austria they are, but. Um, not in Hungary, Poland, and U Ukraine. Uh, just a brief note on website screenshots, which are very common in evidence practice. Um, be aware to check on some particular files, cache, and cookies if they were erased. Otherwise, those uh, could be questioned as sufficient evidence. And uh, Another word on France, uh, we have uh, raids on defendants' premises with IT experts uh, to collect evidence of the infringement. This is um, a law which is implemented and available also in Germany and, and in Austria. I'm now moving on to uh, Wiebke Baas, who will tell you more on preliminary injunctions. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, thank you very much. And um, let's start with injunctions and precautionary measures. Um, if you have a look at Article 9, you can see that um, the scope of harmonization has gone quite far and, and, and the legislator has been pretty detailed. The Enforcement Directive gives um, quite a few requirements, for example, that interlocutory injunctions against imminent infringement must be possible. Um, injunctions must be possible against intermediaries whose services are used for infringement. Um, it rules that applicants must provide reasonably available evidence for their claim. Provisional measures can be taken without the defendant being heard. Ex parte hearings only if necessary. Um, provisional measures may be made subject to payment of security. Measures must be in place that provisional decisions can be revoked. And there also should be a right to claim damages by the defendant if a provisional measure is revoked. So you can see the scope of the um, regulator already is quite detailed. We also have um, some ruling on injunctions. Um, Article 11 states that injunction should be there in order to prohibit the continuation of infringements, also against intermediaries. And in addition, the member states should implement um, the possibility to sanction um, non-compliance of injunctions with the payment of a recurring penalty. So let's start with having a look at how injunctions work in Germany. Um, in Germany, we have a rather long and established tradition of injunctions and especially of interlocutory injunctions in IP. Um, they're quick and sometimes dirty, if I may say so. Um, let me give you an example. This morning, just before we started our first webinar of the day, I um, filed an injunction with our local court, and towards the end of our webinar, I already had um, a note that the, the judge um, had tried to get hold of me because he had a couple of additional questions. 
I sent the documents this afternoon, and I am pretty confident that I will be given the injunction tomorrow so that I can serve it upon my opponent. So ex parte injunctions are available, and especially in IP matters, they're quite common because they do prevent the other party from destroying evidence, from destroying products, or from trying to, to get, get away or from meddle with evidence. But you need to be fast. We do have a requirement of urgency, and it differs from court to court or from, from state to state, but um, urgency usually is only accepted if you either um, are acting four weeks or a maximum of two months after acquiring knowledge of the infringement. So you have to make sure that you know the traditions of the court and you have to be quick, otherwise your right to be granted an interim injunction will have gone. Um, what we do recommend in some cases is that a warning letter to the opposing party should be sent in order to avoid the risk of costs should the injunction not be upheld at the end of the day. And it can also be seen that the costs, because the injunctions are so quick and swiftly taken, they do apply a test of proportionality. So, For example, a court may grant time to sell of stocks or change a name or website to make the the, the effect of the injunction less harsh. Um, as already said in relation to Article 9, the defendant can claim significant damages if the injunction is later overturned. Um, I remember a case where it was the Federal Supreme Court that eventually overturned an injunction which was issued five years before, and um, you will not be surprised that the company who then eventually won the case they really enjoyed a huge um, amount of money, and um, so they really were saved after a long time of trouble where they couldn't act the way they wanted to. After the um, enforcement directive came into place, there was one topic which was particularly de debated in, in Germany, which was the liability of intermediaries. Um, the German legislator did not put this into writing in the statute after the um, enforcement directive came into force simply because they said that we have a long-standing tradition that intermediary liability is given, for example, if there is a duty of care to watch third-party IP violations. Recently, um, the Federal Supreme Court also accepted a potential liability of Internet service providers and access providers under certain restricted conditions. But there always was discussion whether this should be um, turned into law or if, whether it will be okay to, um, to, to, do, to decide on this on a case law basis, which is how it is done at the moment. So how do injunctions work in Eastern Europe? Um, they can be pretty speedy as well. So um, if you really need a speedy injunction, you can be happy if you have jurisdiction in the Czech Republic because um, Prague is particularly quick, the Prague courts. Um, the infringing party may file a written pleading in most Europe Eastern European countries, but not in the Czech Republic, which speeds up the process. Also, under normal circumstances, there are no oral hearings. The exception here is Hungary, who um, also have a reputation have for t taking slightly longer when it comes to, um, to, to obtain a court decision. Um, courts are not bound by st statutory time limits, except in the Czech Republic. There, the court must act within 30 days of having been um, served with the application for an injunction, uh, and then it has to render its decision. In average, on average, it, it takes one to three months until an, um, uh, an injunction is issued. And you can see that this is quick, but um, not as quick as it was in Germany, where it can take up to two days or even less. Um, there is, let me, I have to, just to control the slides, sorry. Um, urgency. Do we have urgency requirements in the CEE? There is no strict concept of urgency as it is in Germany, especially also not in Austria, but the exception here is Hungary. You have to file an injunction six months from the beginning of the infringement or within 60 days of obtaining knowledge 
Otherwise, you won't get an interlocutory injunction. So how is the situation in the United Kingdom? Also in the UK, obviously interim injunctions are possible, but they are much rarer as they are, for example, in Germany. Um, courts only issue them if they are really necessary, for example, in order to avoid destruction of products or evidence. It is, for me, it was very interesting that the focus of the discussion in the UK following the enforcement directive was very much on the scope of argument and consideration. So um, it seems that the guidance that was given by the directive really led to discussion of the balance of convenience. Um, but it seems that the, um, all, all the um, statutory measures and the question that injunctions are given were not, um, they were certainly not a surprise also to the UK system, and it all fitted well into the traditional um, legal structures. Also, the UK has, a, has an urgency requirement um, for interim injunctions. Um, the average is a month um, within which you have to file your injunction. So this leads me to have a look at France. Also, their interim injunctions are part of the standard legal regime. Um, urgency is not a condition, and the claimant has to prove that it is likely that the defendant infringes its trademark rights or to, in order to obtain an injunction. Also here, the regime is slightly stricter than it is, for example, in Germany. Ex parte injunctions are only allowed if the claimant can prove that the circumstances really require that measures will not be ordered in presence of the defendant. And time-wise, inter parte injunctions usually last about two months. The courts can speed this up, however, up to a few days or just a few weeks. In order to have a certain safeguard for the defendant, the judges can demand a guarantee from the claimant to indemnify the defendant if the claimant then loses the case. And it is also possible but rare to obtain an injunction um, in, for, for monies in such proceedings. If the claimant is successful, he is then forced to bring a civil lawsuit on the merits or file a criminal complaint in order to make the decision final. This is similar to the German system where you can also not rely on the results of an interim injunction till the end of time. You also have to, you always have to find a way to make it final either by filing main proceedings or by obtaining a declaration from the defendant that he accepts the declaration as final. So this is my part on interim injunctions. Why you see on this slide there is some that we um, also have thoughts on pan-EU injunctions, but as Dirk already is, has covered it, I will now pass on to my Paris colleague, Jeremy. Thank you, Vivke, and uh, good evening to, to everyone from Paris. Uh, so I am going to, to say a few words about first uh, publicity and uh, secondly, cost of the proceeding. So what is publicity? Uh, we refer to the publication of judicial decision and it derives from Article 15 of the Intellectual Property Rights Enforcement Directive. The provision of the directive were due to be implemented in all member states of the European Union uh, by the end of April 2006. Actually, the, the idea was uh, to provide uh, an, additional, an additional remedy first to the dilution of the IP rights distinctiveness, and secondly, and I think this is the most important part uh, of uh, the, the purpose of the, direct, of the directive, to scare potential future infringers. Uh, so, unfortunately, we have to say that in practice, uh, it's not a success. Uh, for example, in France, this remedy remains very rare. Uh, indeed, publicity is most of the time considered by, by the courts as being useless in light of its purposes, since the ruling on the merits of the case is rendered one or even several years after the infringing acts. So this is really a problem. 
So uh, the second point is uh, costs. The, the question is, can you recover the costs you've incurred in the lawsuit? And this is a very important point to decide whether or not uh, it is appropriate to start an IP infringement proceeding, which is often quite expensive. Uh, this point is not harmonized in, at the European Union level, and this can be sometimes a bar to the enforcement of IP rights since the costs uh, recovered by a successful party are often less than the real cost and the claimant who wins a small judgment may turn out to be a financial loser after paying his or her own expenses. So for example, we can distinguish two different systems in Germany and in France. Um, under German law, uh, the losing party has to bear the cost of the legal proceeding uh, which includes uh, statutory attorney fees. So there is a regulation. And uh, we have made a, a table uh, showing legal fee calculation in Germany. So as you can see, uh, it's uh, very strict and uh, you can uh, know uh, how much you will recover. Under French law, it's uh, really different. Uh, there is no statutory attorney fees, and the court can, but is not forced to, sentence uh, the losing party to bear a lump sum for the winner's counsel fees. But you never recover your world expenses. So it would be important to, to improve the enforcement of IP rights to, um, sorry, to, to improve the enforcement of the IP rights in the European Union, it will be important, uh, in my opinion, to harmonize uh, the issue of the cost proceedings. And I will now hand you over to, to Dirk to conclude. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Um, with that, um, we, we are through with the overview we wanted to provide all of you today. Uh, we have a little bit of time to address one or two of the questions that we've received during the presentation. Um, one of the questions was whether, uh, can you ever get both damages and the defendant's profits? Um, Mark, I think that's the question that concerns your part, so maybe if you could address that very briefly. Hmm, okay, thanks, Dirk. Yeah, interesting question. I, uh, in, in some territories, so for example in the US, I've come across situations where the claimant has successfully been able to claim both damages for the compensatory part and also elements from the um, defendant's profits that it's made out of the infringement. Um, now under a traditional English approach, that, that would have been seen as double recovery. You're getting two bites of the cherry. But um, actually, I think you can regard them as separate um, types of of loss or separate times of compensation, and the enforcement directive is not entirely clear. And certainly in at least one English case, someone has tried to argue that both should be available, and the court recognized that it isn't that clear that you can't have both, and said it just wasn't it for it to decide. It was, it was above its pay grade, as it were, and so it declined to do so. But I think in the right kind of case, there may be scope under the enforcement directive to argue that you should be entitled to both as a claimant, which, which could be a very interesting way forward. I think some other countries in the EU are less um, keen on the idea, or less keen is the wrong word, sanguine that there may be the possibility of doing both. And so again, it may be one of those issues where you, you could forum shop between different jurisdictions if there's enough money potentially at stake. All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, Another question that we received is, is there a harmonization on the rules of damages in case a preliminary injunction is overruled? And I think that part would concern uh, the, the content that Martin has presented. So Martin, maybe you can say something about that. Martin? The issue is with the injunctions, that you could claim for damages in Austria and the damages will be calculated in the discretion of the judge. And 
So at the beginning of the damages proceeding, you will not quite know how much it will be at the end, but the system is working. Yes, so thank you. Maybe I can add something for Germany on that. Um, it's a bit sort of the flip side of the availability to obtain an ex parte injunction comparatively quickly. If you go ahead, get the injunction without the defendant having the opportunity to defend itself, you do enforce it, and then eventually it gets overturned on the field. Of course, you will be on the hook for any damages you may have caused. And given that you can interrupt the sales of products or distribution chains very quickly through that instrument, those damages can, of course, be very substantial. So that's just something um, that that is a, a, a fact of life that you have lived, that you have to live, live with here. Well, I think that wraps it up. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we hope you found what we had to tell you a little bit interesting. And um, do look out for our next webinar in this series. And we will be very happy to welcome you to the next event again. Thank you very much, and bye bye. Thank you.